Hey y'all, and welcome to Geospatial Experiences. I'm your host, Melissa Mayo, and I'm an Esri engineer on the product team. This podcast focuses on the application of geographic information. Let's go on a journey together with some of my amazing coworkers, along with Esri customers, partners, and distributors who are doing really cool work in the field of GIS. Welcome to Geospatial Experiences. I'm excited to be joined today by Sarah Albin, Director of Marketing with EOS Positioning Systems. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Melissa. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm also doing well. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you. We've been trying to get this together for a minute. We have. We have. I'm glad it's finally happening. Yes, absolutely. This is going to be a really fun conversation. And I, I really can't wait for our listeners to hear from you today. And I'm super excited to learn more about you as well as EOS. So shall we dive in? Let's dive in. Yeah. <laughs> So tell us, and this is something I've started with for everybody. Tell us what got you into GIS. Tell me a little bit about your geospatial journey, if you will. Right. So I think like a lot of people, I got in, well, I didn't know about GIS until somebody told me about GIS. Mm -hmm. So my, my history was, you know, since high school, I wanted to be a journalist and a writer. And, you know, I was 18 and I got published in the Chicago Tribune, the Chicago Daily Herald. That was going to be my future. And of course, the dream with that is eventually working for National Geographic. So I was in grad school when um, somebody said, you know, it was a friend of a friend. And they're like, oh, you want to work for Nat Geo? You should take a GIS course. And I'm like, GIS, what's that? So it wound up that my grad my grad school actually had some GIS courses that were available to people in the journalism school. So I took one of those, applied to National Geographic. I got an internship, but the upshot of it was I thought GIS was pretty cool. So when I graduated from grad school, I applied to Esri, didn't hear back. Um, and then almost a year later, out of the blue, somebody from Esri said, you know, hey, I was looking at your application. Would you be interested in interviewing for this other role? And I thought, sure, that sounds great. That was what I wanted in the first place. Um, so I think it was like 11 interviews and some amount of months later, and I was this 20 something year old writer being moved to California to be a writer for this cool software company. And it's just been, uh, it's been pretty cool since then. I love that so much, Sarah. <laughs> I just can't even tell you that's the cutest story. <laughs> and okay, so that's how you got in to GIS. So you were with Esri for a while and then you did you go straight from Esri to EOS or was there something no I cheated on GIS a little bit so <laughs> I went to a project management software company okay still b2b I took everything I had learned about marketing at Esri to this new role and it was a great company they hired extremely well so everybody I worked with was super cool but the software itself was not GIS. It was not as, to me, as cool. You know, with GIS, you get all these cool stories, and we'll probably talk about that later on. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so a colleague from Esri told me that there's this partner who needed a case study or two, and that wound up being my current company, EOS Positioning Systems, and at the time, I was just getting busy enough in my regular career that I was really dwindling down my freelance. And I didn't necessarily want to freelance with anyone, but I've always said yes to a call, right? So I talked with the uh, founder of EOS and he was, he was just so funny and fun to work with that I said, all right, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll do a case study or two with you um, just to help myself learn about new technology and you're fun to work with. So yeah, why not? And it turned out that EOS needed a lot more than just a case study or two. So flash forward six years and I've grown with the company. The company has grown uh, with me and it's a pretty great, pretty great place to be in the partner ecosystem. And I still get to work with a lot of my former colleagues at Esri and new colleagues like Melissa. I know Remy mm -hmm. knows me from a past life. Remy introduced me to you, Melissa. And yes. it's just been a great um, melding of worlds for me. 
you're such a great fit with EOS too. Um, you and the company, y'all are in such lockstep with each other. It it just seems like it's such a natural fit for you to be there and working with EOS. It just you guys complement each other really well. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. They feel like a good company to to work for. Really, it seems like a really good group and really good management and um, really good focus for for the customers too. Honestly. It absolutely is. I mean, I think it's common knowledge that the whoever founded the company and is at the top of the company, whatever their culture is, whatever their heart is, is going to trickle down to everybody. And the way I'm treated at EOS allows me and gives me the freedom to treat my direct reports, my contractors, my customers, my colleagues with a, a free liberty to put the human first. And I don't think that that's common. Um, but it's prevalent at EOS. I love that. That's such a, a good way of putting it too. It's something I've definitely seen just kind of as an outsider looking in because I've never worked with EOS from from the position of being a customer. It's always been just meeting you guys and talking to you guys on the on the um, you know the conference floor or in a situation like this. But even from when I've talked to other people who have worked with you, that always seems like something that's very prevalent. Um, you know, with with EOS for sure. Awesome. That's always good to hear. I never take it for granted. Tell us a little bit about EOS in case our listeners aren't familiar with um, what what you do, what the company does, and kind of the focus of EOS. Yeah. So EOS Positioning Systems is an Esri Gold partner. We are actually a Canadian company, and we're based in a small suburb just outside Montreal. Uh, we actually just turned 10 years old uh, this month, last week. So Happy that was fun. Thank you. It's a lot of fun. Um, it's a huge milestone, especially for the couple of people who have been there for the full 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, we uh, were our kind of claim to fame. We came on the scene because our founder was responsible for creating the first GPS or GNSS receiver that was capable of providing one centimeter of accuracy directly into iOS devices and other devices via Bluetooth. That had never been done before at the time. Um, and our mission since then has been to make survey grade technologies, traditionally GNSS technologies that were available only to surveyors, accessible, affordable, and easy to use for GIS users. Um, concurrent when all of that was happening, you know, Apple was releasing iPhones for the first time. Uh, ArcGIS Online had come out, and then you had, at the time, our uh, collector for ArcGIS, which is now ArcGIS Field Maps with a lot of other functionalities. You've got Survey123 and Quick Capture. So all of these technologies were coming together at directly, you know, the right time to put the power of digital maps and accuracy into the hands of anyone. Um, so we still work very closely today with the Esri mobile teams. And the main thing that we do in our desire is to design and manufacture high accuracy mobile solutions for GIS users or GIS adjacent users. That could be field workers, municipal workers, um, all, all types of folks in the field, forestry folks. Uh, and, and yeah, that's really what we focus on. I would say EOS is very much an on the ground technology. Um, it's very kind of on the forefront of, of technologies too. You guys are very much moving and progressing forward. How, I'm trying to think, but your the use cases and the, the use cases and the users for the Aero pro, uh, products are really varied. You can, you have users in all sorts of different areas and all sorts of different fields. Um, it's amazing. I saw a post where, you had uh that you posted on linkedin where you had the the turtle in the background where it was photobombing the the people that were working you, your technology is used all over the world in such a varied range of of ways so how do you navigate around all those different spaces all those different fields and industries and be able to resonate so well with customers it is a daily challenge and <laughs> opportunity um you know, when I worked at Esri, there were very concrete, and in, in the teams I worked with, they were organized by industry. So I had leaders in telecom and gas and electric 
and all sorts of transportation who could educate me on the jargon that I might encounter when talking with these various customers. I hold a lot of those lessons with me today and I carry them with me today, which I think allows me to dive into conversations with those types of customers and everybody else is a learning curve. And even within those industries, so much has changed and evolved and progressed that it really is a constant learning endeavor. You have to be curious about people. You have to be willing to say, I've not heard that term before. Could you explain it to me? Um, and you have to be interested in how people are using the combined technologies from EOS and Esri to change the world. So for me, I can get over the hurdle of any jargon as long as I can find the human interest in a story. And to your point, we've got people who use our combined technologies for the infrastructure bucket, as I like to say, and then there's also the natural resources bucket, as I like to say. So infrastructure is your utilities, municipalities, transportation, all AEC. Natural resources is your forestry, your vineyards, which are always cool stories. And then you've got the rare, really evidently human interest stories like drone mapping in the Galapagos Islands, which you're talking about that photo, which is just one of my favorite photos a customer has ever given to me to publish. Um, not just because there's this ancient tortoise photobombing, you know, him data collecting with the GNSS receiver, but also because on an island that's that remote where he didn't have internet and had to boat in all of his water, that customer took the time to take amazing photos just for me. Um, mm -hmm. That's just so awesome. And uh, yeah, so it, it's just constantly learning. And uh, if, if you don't love learning about what people are doing, then, you know, it wouldn't be a right environment, but everybody's got a cool story. I'm convinced. I think so too. And, you know, just the fact that that customer was willing, like you said, to take the time to take those pictures for you and send that back to you, that speaks volumes for how you treat your customers and how you work with them and the relationship you build with them. Honestly, it really does speak volumes for that because you always are so committed to your customers and what you're talking about with your efforts, as far as the, um, you know, as far as being interested in the human story and the human piece, you and I resonate really well with that because that's the, the point of the podcast too. I mean, it's just like what we're trying to do here is capture that human story, capture, you know, the things that resonate with the guests and the things that have kind of um, been important to them as they've moved through their journey and what's important to them now and kind of what keeps them going. I love, I love that human piece of it too. And so it just, I feel like it's so important in our field to not forget that, yes, we have the technology. Yes, we have um, you know, these, this, this super cool software and all these amazing things that we can work with, but the people behind the scenes, the people behind the keyboards, behind the, the, the piece of equipment that you're using, they're equally, if not more important because, and, and finding out what, what their story is, is so important too. hundred percent. And that's not, that's not the customer in that specific case, just <laughs> liking Sarah's email and saying, well, sure, I'll take gigabytes of media for you on the Island. That's, you know, our technology team that created the only product on the planet that could actually work in this specific environment that he needed. And then that's our dealer, who's not even our employee, developing the relationship with that customer to then, you know, be able to provide him that receiver for a couple of months. Um, so it's all those people that I lean on before I even get to the customer. And if I didn't have them and the relationships they build, my job would be impossible. I feel like, too, the people in those stories kind of help drive the technology and the innovation behind them, because the more you learn about kind of how people can use your technology and how they need it and the use cases and, and kind of what they're trying to do, that can drive those conversations when you're trying to figure out how are we moving our company and our technology forward. 100%. Um, that's actually how we've developed a lot of, I think, all of, we have three core free solutions that we offer our customers. So if they're a customer of Esri and they're a customer of EOS, they can access these solutions. And I won't go into all of them because that'd probably be overkill. But those solutions came about because customers came to us. And it doesn't matter if it's a customer with one receiver or 100 receivers, but they came to us and they said, hey, I want to do this. And this is why I want to do it. Can I do that? And we come back, we invest the R&D and we figure out a way for them to be able to do that if we can offer that way. Um, that's how we got laser mapping, underground utility mapping. It was just customers coming to us and saying, 
do you think I could? And us saying, let's try. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I think that's awesome. I think it's a just a really good approach to have, to be willing to listen to them and listen to their needs and kind of, you know, absorb what they're trying to do and then be proactive as far as taking that and trying to take action with it too. And just see, you know, see what you can do, be afraid to, or not being afraid to fail, being willing to, you know, Hey, this may work. This may not work. Let's figure it out and see what we can do. 100%. Yeah. Tell me how does EOS continue to grow in popularity and success? That's what, you know, it, it's just really interesting to me how different companies and the partners um, they're so different and amazing in their own right. And you guys just really continue to steadily keep growing you know, with the market, with the customers, with popularity. I just, yeah, let's talk about that a minute. I think we are transitioning really well into that topic because at the end of the day, it does come from being human beings and listening to what your customers, partners, suppliers, contractors, employees want. And EOS always has that mentality. So when somebody comes to us with an idea we just try to see if we can make it work and make it easy for them to do. And I think that, you know, I'd like to say it's all the marketing, but that's not realistic. A lot of the times what I hear is that there is a healthy word of mouth in the GIS industry, in the various industry communities that we serve. And if you're doing something right, people are willing to talk about it and share that knowledge. And at the end of the day, a lot of people just want to know what their friend is using that works. And we benefit from that by just focusing on providing something that works and being there as human beings if anybody has questions for us. Um, that seems a little lofty to say, but it's what we try to do. Um, and I think it's, it's helped us grow. Do you feel like GIS growth is really a function of kind of customers sharing those stories and the shared customer stories between them and kind of talking about what's worked here and what hasn't worked and being able to have kind of that networking opportunity to be able to share experiences with each other in the field. It's huge. Yeah. And this is why conferences are so important and why COVID was so painful for a lot of people. There was a hunger just to have a human and ask them, you're doing that too. How did you do that? I need to do the exact same thing. And we see that desire and that hunger in all of the industries we're working with, whether it's figuring out how to replace your lead pipes or being able to meet uh, new gas tracking and traceability industry standards or having to um, map invasive species for nonprofits. Everybody has something they're trying to do that somebody else is concurrently trying to figure out or has figured out. And it's only by being able to network and say, this really worked for me, but watch out for that, that they're able to find the best solutions. So it's critical. It's what helps proliferate all of our industries um, faster than would be without. So yeah, it's critical. I think that's such a good answer, Sarah. I think you've, you, you're, you're really attuned. You're so attuned to the people part of this, the people element. Um, like, you know, we've been chatting about that and how important that is to you, but you really do a good job of really zeroing in um, your interest and then having, having, having a heart for it as well. You're, you're super invested and you really care about making sure people have a good experience with EOS for sure. I try to. <laughs> you. You, you mentioned, sorry, I'm flattering you too much and it's going to make you nervous. So <laughs> it is, yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit. You mentioned the conferences, so let's spend a little bit of time there. If, if you're cool with that, what I'm curious, what goes into EOS's marketing strategy for conferences? Cause you guys are always there. You always have a booth set up, you know, you're, you're very representative at a lot of different conferences. We put a lot of thought into which conferences we go to, which conferences we go to with partners, with our regional representatives. So I don't think I explained, but we are a designer and manufacturer based in Canada. And that means that we do do direct sales to Canada, but mm -hmm. for majoritively everywhere else on the planet, we have a dealer network and a distribution network that we rely on. And a lot of the times with conferences, we are collaborating with our regional representatives. And so it's a constant discussion of you know, what do we add? What do we keep? What do we um, it's rare that we'll take something away, but we're always evaluating having those conversations. 
And then once we decide to go to a conference, and of course, Esri conferences are just a no-brainer for us. Those are our people, um, even Esri distributor conferences like Esri UK, Esri Australia, uh, Esri, I think Esri Deutschland we started doing, Esri France, we've been at every single year, um, a bunch of the Esri distributors in South America. We try to be there where we know that there is a reciprocal need for the product that we're seeing. Um, and once we're in, we just try to have a strong presence that is representative of the audience we anticipate and we work together. Some kind of, could take months, it could take weeks, it could take in the case of the Esri user conference. That's the biggest event that we do. It's one of the single biggest projects per year that we do. And it's really all hands on deck to prepare for something like that. And mm -hmm. every year I say, you know, the, the booth team that we bring into that conference is just the strongest booth team. They are from different countries. They speak different languages. We've got staff, we've got dealers, um, and everybody just fits seamlessly together as if they're a cohesive team that works in the office every day together. Um, and that's what makes it work is relying on that booth team and yes, being prepared prior, but it's at the end of the day, you could prepare all you want, but if you don't have the right team in the booth, that's going to make or break your conference. You guys do have such a good team that works that booth and you do come, come across and you, you appear as if you worked, like you said, in the office every day together. Um, it's a really, it's a really good team for the UC team that you guys put to, put together every time. They'll do Thank a good you. job. Thank you. So, how do you personally prepare for conferences? You know, they can be they can be overwhelming. Um, they can be exhausting. So, how do you do it? What do you do? Personally, prepare for conferences. Um, I'm no longer ashamed to check two bags. <laughs> So there's a lot of sleep and exercise that happens beforehand, eating quality food just to prepare for what you're about to do to your body at a conference in terms of sleep deprivation, caffeine overload, trying to find water, but maybe you don't take a sip till 4 p.m. Um, and just talking all day. So there's like the physical preparation almost. I sound like an athlete. It's not that extreme, but um, <laughs> but realistically. And then if it's a new event, I'll definitely research what's going on at the event, who the audience is, what kind of, for me to be able to do my job, what kind of marketing materials should be there for that specific audience. If it's a conference I've been to for a while, I'll you know, mostly skip over that part unless something new has happened. Um, and then it's just a, a flipping a switch in your brain to say when you're at this conference, I, I don't have an inbox. I don't have text messages. I have the conference and that's the priority. Um, so you put a lot on pause. And of course you bring multiple pairs of shoes, which is a tip I learned from a colleague at Esri. Absolutely. You have to have the multiple pairs of shoes. My feet hurt so bad. I think you've got <laughs> so the, yes. The trick is you bring multiple pairs of shoes so that after day one, your feet hurt in a specific place, but they don't hurt when you're wearing your pair two of shoes yes. and you just change the part that hurts so you don't get into trouble. Absolutely. You're always so friendly at the conference and you're always outgoing, you know, when you're on the floor or even if we run into you in the hallways or whatever. So do you have a routine to keep your energy up? I know you were talking about prepping before you get there, but what do you do to keep your energy up while you're there? And you talk, you have to talk to so many people. You, you, you're talking all day, every day. What about your voice? Because, you know, you and I have had some conversations as I've been prepping, you know, trying to get my voice back, you know, right to be able to record for this. What do you, what do, you do at the shows? Because that's just, Remy loses his voice every day, every year <laughs> of the conference. It By about noon, he's he's toast. So <laughs> I must be seeing him before noon then. I'm great. I got to yeah. make a note. See Remy before noon. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's weird. I, the only time I've ever lost my voice after conferences was when I, wound up getting COVID after conferences. Yeah. I'm like, that's that's a telltale sign. But I think the basics are pretty important. You gotta hydrate. You can't be ashamed. I I'm I do not have any children, but I travel as though I have five children who always need snacks. Um, mm -hmm. hydration. You just gotta not be ashamed to know exactly like what your body needs so that you can be whole and not need something in the middle of you know, a 15 minute conversation with a customer. You got to take care of yourself, right? Cliche, but it goes a long way. It really does. And the UC is such a, 
a big event and it, it's kind of a marathon, honestly. I mean, you know, you're, it's, it, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of stuff after, you know, what's going on during the day, things happen in the evenings and stuff. And so it's, you do have to take care of yourself. I always have snacks. I'm like you, I have all, all kinds of snacks when I, when I go, cause I'm, I, I am one of those people that needs, needs her snacks. So I have to. And we, we even have a, I do a kickoff call with everybody who's going to be in the UC booth before we get there. And one mm -hmm. of the slides I always go over for anybody who's new is to remind them exactly what you just said. This is a marathon. It is not a sprint. If you've never been to this conference, you cannot go all in day one. You, you're there for the long haul. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually, for that event, we do provide, you know, we make a Costco run beforehand and yeah. we make, we stock up on waters and snacks. Somebody there was somebody in a booth across from us last year and he's a friend of a friend of a partner. And he said, you know, every time you disappear into the closet in your booth, you come back with snacks. It's like, you're going to Narnia. <laughs> yes. I love that. That's hilarious. But you have to, you have, you have to. Absolutely. So what do you think about the people who are attending let me say, let me back up and say, how, do, what do you think about the GIs people who are attending conferences? How are they changing? Um, so what I've noticed, and let's say I started going to GIS conferences in 20, gosh, probably 2013, 2014, thereabouts. So I've got a decade experience. It's not the most of anybody, but it's enough to start to see trends. And I think what I'm noticing now is there are more women. You know, I was at the Esri Federal GIS Conference last week, and it seemed like every other person I was talking to, maybe even more of that, tipped in the favor of women. Um, and it's it's just refreshing. It's awesome. And I don't think I was highly aware of it, you know, 10 years ago that, you know, oh, there's a woman. I guess that, that's unique. But it was at the time and seeing that shift now, it just it's adding a really nice um, environment to the conferences for me. I've definitely noticed that, too, especially when when I first got into the field and I didn't go to conferences, but even just going to meetings and things. Um, sometimes I was the only woman or one of only one or two. And as you as as you mentioned, the more, you know, as, you know, when you're going to conferences now, you're seeing more and more and more of that representation. And it's great. That's right. Can I flip the question on you and ask what you've seen in your career being a woman who was working in the GIS technology itself? You know, it really, for me, it really was um, kind of a, a boys club. You know, there was a lot of a lot of men in the field, a lot of men in the meetings and in the companies. And, and also I worked in, in companies that sort of gravitated toward um, with the other people who were in there. It, it kind of lended toward um, a male environment, a male centric environment. Um, which was totally fine. No issues with that. It just was what it was, you know. And the more I've I've gone to conference, I just see, you know, Esri puts out the women in GIS books. So they collect the stories of of women in the field. And so they have the meetings and um, you know, there's a um a user session that 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 you can go to focused around, you know, supporting and building up women in GIS. And so I just see I didn't see that, you know. 10, 15 years ago, it's really been progressing lately. And, and I love seeing that. I love to see the the diversity in our field. I love to see the variety of, of people who are getting into GIS and GIS. Um, and one thing I've, I've been noticing lately too, is that we, we have the, the traditional GIS people, the ones that are either, you know, um, on the job trained GIS folks, or they, they have their education, their background in it. We have all those people, but we're starting to bring in more you know, engineers, more executives, more business, you know, kind of centric people, just just people that aren't as trained classically or, you know, either on the job in GIS may, may or may not be their sole role. Maybe they're supervising a GIS team or maybe they know about GIS adjacently. We're getting a lot more of those people coming to the conferences to kind of figure out what is this GIS thing and how do I make it more applicable in my job, as well as how do I get my people going with it? How do we get this plugged in? That's been fun to watch for me. Is just seeing the variety of different, um, not disciplines, because GIS has always been very interdisciplinary, but just those different positions that aren't necessarily what you would think traditionally as being GIS folks. Mm. They're coming to Hundred percent. Yeah, this is a great point. You no, know, we we did a case study right when COVID happened. There's the city of Sarasota, Florida. 
it's largely a tourist town. So it's the kind of town that inflates with population and deflates. And when COVID happened, it deflated, but so drastically and so off season that the leaders in that municipality reached out to anybody, all the departments and said, does anybody have work that our admins and receptionists could do because we're running out of work for them? And the GIS you know, champions at the time and to the credit of the IT leader above him, who was not strictly GIS, they said, well, we've always wanted to map our street lamps. So they rented some GPS receivers from us and they did like socially distanced training in the parking lot for people who had never touched a digital map before, you know, probably apart from Google Maps. And they went out and they collected all their street lamps. So anybody can use these maps, this hardware, these tools, at this stage in the game. And it is cool to see that exposure across different roles, as you said. Yeah, that's been amazing too, because it used to be you were a GIS person and you knew what to do and you were the person that had to do the thing. But now, like you said, anybody can pick up and use these tools. It, it really is opening and broadening the range of people who can be exposed, but also hands-on, engaged and involved in, in our world and in our space. Absolutely. So I, 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 that's one thing I do really love about the, you know, the progression of, of GIS and the industry as a whole is just how, um, how the way the technology is moving to be more, to be easier to use, to be, you know, you, you still need the GIS people who are, you know, clicking those buttons and doing that heavy analysis, but you're just, you're, bring, you're bringing in tools and applications that are more user-friendly and they're, you know, more in, in, uh, I've got to get my words together, Sarah. They're more geared for having people who aren't GIS people use them. I mean, that's the intent. Yes. That's the purpose. And that brings in folks who don't know what GIS is and don't know that they're doing a GIS, but they're able to contribute. They're able to contribute by collecting data and, you know, playing in this space. And they also become the champions because then they go, I did this thing over here and it was amazing. And it was not only was it fun to make, but look how helpful this has been for us. <laughs> Yes, exactly that. And it's not to say, to your point, there will always be a need for the the engineers, the GIS professionals, the surveyors, um, but it is great to see this becoming just so accessible to other people. And you know, too, you were mentioning the conferences and, and how important that is to networking and engaging. I know, you know, during COVID when they had to go virtual on the conferences, that the the numbers boosted huge. You know, typically it's about 20,000 attendees in San Diego when it's an in-person event and it boosted up to almost 100,000 attendees when it was virtual, um, which I'm sure that, which I wasn't at Esri then, I'm sure that gave them um, a lot of technical challenges to work through to be able to manage that many attendees and, and be able to, to keep everything up and running. But um, I think that, you know, that probably gave a lot more exposure to people who otherwise would not have had exposure to Esri, to GIS, to the UC, you know, just being able to have it open and available from the virtual perspective and let people just log in and, and you know, access it and listen to what they were interested in listening to. Um, that had to have broadened people's awareness and exposure uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that had never been offered and afforded to them before. Yeah, I, th I think so. I think if there's anything that we can focus on that was good that came out of that whole experiment, it is the realization that having the option of digital access to events is great for people who genuinely cannot get there. I was talking to a customer two weeks ago, I believe. He works in the telecommunications industry in Canada. And I asked him if he ever went to the Esri, the Esri Infrastructure Management GIS Conference, IMGIS. And he said, yeah, he does. And then he added, as a digital attendee, he's never been there in person. And I thought, okay, that that is that is such a meaningful experience to him that he almost didn't add that he did it as a digital attendee. Now, of course, I would love for him to get there as a physical attendee. Um, sure. He's got a great story to tell. But uh, but yeah, that, that vestigial um thing that we walked away with this ability to attend conferences virtually. I don't think it's anybody's first choice, but it's absolutely a great choice if you can't be there in person. Better than nothing for sure, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and just to to hang around this kind of networking conversation that we're talking about a little bit, what would 
do you, and I, I've asked this for, for a couple of people that's kind of come up um, in the last few days that I've been recording and, and chatting. What would you say to people who, if they don't get to go to conferences and they struggle to get out and, and be able to engage in person with other people for whatever reason, how do they build their network? What would what do you recommend for people to help them build their network when they, you know, don't have the resources or don't have the ability to to really get get out and go? Because I mean, I know the conferences are one way I've built my network over the years. Um, I've also been in jobs that sort of lended to that. You know, I ended up going to different types of meetings and really having um, you know a, an opportunity to leave my office and leave where. I was working in person and go and be exposed to different groups. So um, that was something that really was was helpful for me that I know built my built my connections better. But what do you recommend for people who really want to build that network? I think if you can't go to conferences, there's two avenues you really have to look at. One is just, you know, in the day to day of what you're doing in your job, you're meeting people most likely. Now, mm-hmm. My position is probably unique in that I have a constant, constantly increasing virtual Rolodex of customers who are willing to tell their stories. And I always connect with them on LinkedIn and add them to my network. And I've got that going back, even project management software users are in my you know, LinkedIn and pop up. Um, but everybody I work with, I try to have a positive experience and add them to my network. And then if you if you're working remotely or you really, and you can't get to conferences and it's the double whammy where you don't have an office and you don't get out, you've got to focus on groups that are available to you and make an effort to connect with those groups, whether they're social groups, professional groups, everybody is a network at that point. I think that's a great answer too. I know LinkedIn's an easy one as far as, hey, if you're connected with me and you see something that I post or you see somebody that's a connection of mine, and you're interested, go reach out to that person, you know, it, that's difficult for some people to do. I mean, a lot of people I think are, are probably shy and they're a little hesitant to reach out to, to folks, but um, I hadn't thought really as much about the social group element that you're talking about, because there's, there's things going on all around, you know, whether it's, you know, get into geocaching or get into something, you know, that's Absolutely. kind of related and you can meet people and you just never know who you're going to meet that, you know, know somebody that knows somebody that's going to be super beneficial for you to know down the line. hundred percent. And you'd be surprised how many people uh, secretly know about GIS. Yeah, happens. it does. It really does. Uh, it's always fun when you, you know, someone asks, what do you do? And you say, well, I'm in GIS. And you start the typical, well, you know, it's computer-based mapping. And, and they're like, oh, yeah, I know about GIS. And you're, you know, you're taken aback. Yes. Awesome. Yes. The entire conversation changes. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, oh. They go from, you know, oh, that that's that's interesting or that's neat to you can just have a full on convo with them because once you're both on the same page, then it's golden then, right? Yes. They're like, oh, you've had the Kool-Aid. Okay. Yes, I'm gonna exactly. change everything I was about to say. Let me completely shift the script over here, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it seems like in your role, communicating with, you know, customers in an effective fashion would be super important. So how do you work with your team? You're really good at it. Um, and I think you've spent a lot of time kind of crafting and cultivating your ability to be good at that. Um, but not everybody who's going to come in is going to necessarily be as comfortable and be, you know, as sociable and, and all of that. So how do you work with people within your team to make sure they can c- effectively communicate with customers, can share the stories, can do what they need to do in that respect? Sure. Well, in I've got a cascading series of priorities that happen when I'm, bless you, when I'm, when I'm working with customers, collaborating with customers, always a priority is you should be available for a rapid response within reason. I mean, if it's Christmas or if it's a holiday or if it's the weekend, there are healthy boundaries that you have to be able to set. But if it's not a big imposition on me and I can respond to the customer, I'm going to choose to do that. So a fast response is always my priority. And that what competes with that is the desire to self-edit and have a perfect response. And what I've learned in the past several years is finding that balance of, of um, you know, being comfortable with your real personality in email and just being willing to shoot somebody off and showing the customer exactly who you are, what you're trying to accomplish, 
anything that you should disclose to them right away. Everybody appreciates that. And you really dig into a rich, even email conversational tone with customers when you're going back and forth like that. It's almost like they become a pseudo colleague for the weeks and months that you're working with them on a project. And it feels like that because you're building not just an email exchange, but a relationship. Um, so a fast response and honest response, obviously as short a response as you can make helps mm -hmm. things out. Um, but the, it's, it's a constant evolution and, you know, being someone who has studied intently the English language and how it evolves, you also have to be willing to evolve. Um, if you're talking to a, you know, somebody who's in their first job versus a veteran, you shift your language to really be able to communicate effectively with even that private audience of one. Um, so that's a big consideration as well. Even though it's not for public consumption, you should always be changing your approach to a message based on who you're talking to. Uh, so it's constantly evolving, but there are some basic, you know, pillars of, of respect, fast response, honest response, short response is also respectful, but yeah, when it can be. Well, clear and concise rather than short necessarily. You want to get your point and make your point without a lot of extra fluff that just kind of the customer or the person you're working with has to dig through unnecessarily, right? That's a better way of saying it right there. Clear and concise. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so I, I do want to, and we, we talked about this a little bit already, but I kind of want to dig in a little bit more. How has GIS changed since you've been in the business? And and we talked about it from a people perspective, but let's, let's get into the technology a little bit more too. As what I'm seeing now. Yeah. And I, it's a great question. And I wish I were a more technical person, right? When I took when I took GIS courses, they were all on a desktop and it had to be, you know, on a PC, not on your iPhone. Mm -hmm. um, it has shifted dramatically since then. Obviously, the mobile aspect of those evolutions are most interesting to me now because of what they mean for the future of my business, EOS Positioning Systems, and also our partnership with Esri. Um, you've got things like the, I mean, the Apple just released the Vision Pro headset and how is that going to change and alter and be adopted and impact expectations of wearable mobile devices and the data you can get on wearable mobile devices. You've got Esri bringing to fruition the utility network on mobile. And now that's a really cool thing to start to think about because people can use it today and they are using it. So what's that going to do? Uh, for tracking and traceability in the field. I mean, my gosh, that's that's a game changer. Um, so these things are happening and they're happening fast. And then there's an entire portion of GIS evolving where you've got AI being brought into the conversation in a meaningful, real and tangible way that people can work with today. I don't claim to know all of those use cases. It's not my domain, but I see it happening on the peripheral of what we focus on at EOS. And it's just mind blowing to really think about where we're going to go in the next five years. Where do you see the future of GIS heading? I know you touched on it a little bit, but what are your predictions, Sarah? Well, I've disclosed I'm not an AI master. So <laughs> I think that will be a big player, but I'm not going to go into that. What I do see in the customers I talk with and the trends that I'm seeing uh, is I believe in the next, you know, give it X number of years, five, 10, so on and so forth, more people who have not yet been exposed to GIS will be exposed to GIS in a way where they actually realize that it has a name, GIS. So what I mean by that is everybody saw the Johns Hopkins map of COVID and its spread, but not everybody knew it. that's GIS, that's ArcGIS. I think that what we're seeing at, especially the municipalities that truly power the country, all of them have teams that manage infrastructure. And what we're seeing is that those veteran workers who have been managing the utilities, the infrastructure, they know where everything is, they're comfortable on paper maps, they're starting to retire in a real way and want to retire in a real way. And the new workforce coming in has to be able to access the knowledge in their head. 
And these are you know, people who expect things to be on an iPhone, on a tablet. Um, and so that type of exposure to this next generation of workers in all of our cities, I think is gonna be one of the most biggest silent trends that we see happening where you go to, to a holiday lunch or something like that and somebody's using GIS in their job. And that to me is really cool because it's 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 a silent shift in how we all benefit from GIS. I think that's such a good answer. Uh, you you are just I don't know if you know it, Sarah. You you're very humble, but you are brilliant. You come up with some of the greatest, some of the best little answers, and you just surprise me with it. So I love that. Well, you can have me back on in that case. I'm just kidding. You know, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're good questions. I hope they're good questions. Yeah. Well, well, thanks. I didn't try. I'm not trying to stump anybody and put anybody really. I've, I've a couple of times people like, oh, you're putting me in the hot seat. You know, it's like, well, no, I just really want thoughtful questions and that will kind of prompt insightful responses and have a good conversation. So I don't want to just be surface level. We're trying to get a little past surface level here, right? Yeah, that's the good stuff. It's the only stuff worth talking about. Absolutely. So what? These may these may be the hot seat questions. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> what what would you say is your favorite use for GIS? That's the most controversial question you've asked me. <laughs> it, well, yeah, I know because you're like, well, we've got these, you know, this equipment here that I'm supposed to say is my favorite use, but you know. <laughs> well, because it, it it feels like, and it, I mean this truthfully, it does feel like whatever customers I'm working with currently are my favorite, favorite use cases. And I know that's cliche, but even, you know, stories that I've done in industries that I've written about for years, I still learn something new and something I didn't know that needed to be done. So they are, but so I'm going to give you maybe recent examples because there's just so many, but we are actually working uh, with a high school in Detroit. Okay. And it's called Frederick Douglass Academy for Young Men. And these kids come from not the best backgrounds. It's not the most, you know, that city has gone through a lot. And these kids have gone through a lot. And they go through a three-year GIS Pathways program at their public high school. And they oh, wow. learn how to use, it's super cool. They learn how to make maps. They do 30-day map challenges. They um, we donated some of our receivers so that they can learn how to map with high accuracy. They fly drones and get licensed. Um, and when they come out of it, they have an option that is extremely viable for careers. And if not, they've also got, um, most of them earn college credit throughout this high school program in the GIS field. And they've got okay. the option to go on and pursue that. And that to me is mind blowing because I didn't learn about this you know, in, in my nice Chicago suburb, nobody told me about GIS. Um, so it, it's mind blowing to give those kids exposure to this career. And that's really cool. Um, it, it, it's cool that the company can do that as well. So that's, we're, we're publishing a video and a story about that later on this month. Um, but that's just one of the cool, it's not even a use case. It's just a cool way the technology is being used to further the lives of those students, most of whom want to give back to their communities when they have jobs. Um, That's amazing. How long has it been? How long has it been going on? How long have you guys been, you know, working with them? We were exposed to this program last year. Okay. And we were approached by a partner, actually, a partner of both EOS and Esri, and they were looking for industry supporters. Their grant had just run out which the grant is used specifically to pay for the student's college credits. And when you look at it, it winds up being a couple hundred bucks per credit per student, which is right. just, it's cheaper than any credit I ever paid for, for myself. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a no brainer for us and we knew we wanted to support them. And then we were actually lucky enough to go visit them and they just absorbed us into their world for two days last year. And mm -hmm. it was just, you know, we were, my, me and my coworker, you know, we were the only females walking around this all boys school, apart from a couple of teachers. And they just took us in like we had been there the entire time. Um, but I will give them a plug because they could definitely use more support. We actually did a GoFundMe for them over the holidays 
but anybody can reach out to Eastern Michigan University, or you could even fill out a contact form on the EOS website, and we'll be able to get you to the right person if you wanted to contribute to those students' futures in GIS. We're going to chat about that offline in a minute, too. You and I are going to talk about that in a minute okay. <laughs> when we finish recording, because um, I have more questions. But you know what's going to be neat? If you guys, and I'm sure you will, stay engaged with them and continue to assist and, and you know, go go and have meetings and kind of engage with them and follow some of them on their paths and see how this fall, you know, see how this goes to fruition. See if, if some of them go into the field, if some of them come out of the program and, you, you know, use those credits to go into the, uh, to, to a college program. I think it's just going to be neat if you can do a full circle story uh, with some of them, if you guys stay in touch. So you, I you love that idea. I love it. Yeah. That. I'm here for it. <laughs> all right. All right. Yeah. We'll talk. Yeah. That's yeah, a great yeah, idea. Cool. <laughs> so are there I, you know I know you're a big reader I know that you are um, I know that you're you know that's one of your um, pastimes hobbies words are escaping me at the moment are there any publications that you really like to use that you like to read that you feel like best represent GIS in the real world or something else relevant that we've talked about today that you know just really has a good um, embodiment of of our technologies and the things that we do. Yeah. So honestly, Arc G or Arc News is just the it's the top of that list. It tells me, it gives me a sliced view into each of the different things that's going on in the GIS world that I might not have known about, and they might not directly pertain to what I do every day, but they're good to be aware about because they might pertain to what my customers are dealing with every day. Mm -hmm. So that's a must read. I think for anyone and it's free. So crazy if you don't, don't subscribe to it. Mm -hmm. um, the Esri industry newsletters are also great reading. Um, yeah, I, I have been a fan of those for years at this point. Outside things that are published by Esri, I mean, of course, ArcWatch, ArcUser. Um, I like Directions Magazine quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And then we, um, we partner with a variety of publications, you know, for other industries that are, or other regions that are global. Um, and there are a variety, there's a French language magazine that I pretend to use to brush up on my French. It's called SIGMAG. Um, uh -huh. The publisher is Xavier. And they really are a flagship publication for French speaking GIS users. And they have great content. Uh, so I enjoy that one a lot, or at least what I can glean of that one. Mm -hmm. um, but what I most like to see are publications that are not GIS focused, where you see a GIS story. And yeah. that's where it brings it home. That's the best, the most rewarding. Mm -hmm. That feels so, yeah, I, I'm with you on that because that really shows the application. Because when you're focused in GIS, it makes sense that you have really good use cases for a GIS or, you know, the technology. But when you're in something and when you're in a totally different arena or a publication that's focused in a different arena and they're utilizing GIS, they're applying it for what they need. I'm with you too. I love that as well. That just really resonates big time. I get, I get excited about that one. <laughs> same, same. Mm -hmm. And it's fun too, because you get to see how others perceive our industry. You know, you get to see it from a completely different perspective because we think we're great. You know, we think our GIS stuff is awesome. You know, we're, we're partial, <laughs> biased in that way. Um, but when we get to read it from another perspective, so if we're reading about it in a biology magazine or a geology publication or something like that, you're getting it from their angle and from their perspective. And so I think that's, you know, really telling and super useful as well for us to understand how this field and how this industry is perceived by others who it's not their, um, I'm going to say it, not their first language, not their first, you know not their first, um, you know, their first go-to as far as what they do and what they utilize. 100%. Yeah. You've talked a little bit about this. I don't know. I don't know if we want to go into this anymore, but, but if you do, we're totally fine to, um, tell me some, about some of your favorite projects that you've worked on with customers. If you can, um, you just have customers in so many spaces. I know you work with some really interesting people on really special endeavors. Are there any that truly, really resonated with you that you want to chat about that you can, you know, chat about some that really, you know, kind of connected for you? Yeah. So things that I find cool, which are a bit representative, you know, we have, 
uh, it's just cool to me that my hometown gas utility, you know, mm-hmm. they're a customer of ours. So they provide oh, my funny. gas. Yeah. And I went to a local, um, a local conference where somebody from the gas utility that I pay every month is -hmm. presenting on how they're using our products to map utility assets at the zoo that I used to go to when I was a child on field trips. And it's Mm -hmm. so full circle to me. It's the neatest thing. So that was just a cool one personally that resonated with me. And um, there are some meaningful stories that come out of what we do. And We've got, you know, National Park Service, which not a lot of people realize, but in some parts of California, you can get 40 feet of snow in the mountains in a single winter season. And so there's one park, it's the Lassen National Park. Lassen Volcanic Park is Yes, one thank you. You are the National Park. I knew, I knew I was missing volcanic. I'm like, well, this is going to get me on this. You've probably no been there. Problem. I love Lassen. I love Lassen. Yes. <laughs> They're customers of yours and ours. They so are. They are. So they they get they can get up to 40 foot of snow in a single season. And there's one road in and out yep. of that park. And it winds around one of the mountains or volcanic areas. Right. Mm-hmm. So it goes around this mountain. And it's somebody's job every spring season when the time has come to clear all of that snow off of the one winding road. And this gets a little less, you know, nice to say, but it was a reality that what they were using in the past to be able to find the road in that white blanket was not accurate enough. And so occasionally they would have a vehicle that would tumble over the mountain. Mm -hmm. So it was a priority for them to be able to when the road is clear, map the edge of it with that centimeter level of precision. And at the time they were using collector, now they're onto field maps. Um, And when winter comes and they're sending those trucks to clear the road, they can know exactly where that edge is so they can avoid going over while they're clearing that road. And they haven't had an accident since, at least the last time I talked to our contact there. That's a meaningful case, and it's one I would never think about, predict. It's not utilities. It's not you know, forestry, but it's so meaningful that once you hear that story and somebody's telling you it, you're just changed. You never look at a national park the same way. You never look at your technology the same way or snow. You just see something uh, that that is really meaningful. I think that's awesome. You wrote an article about it, or you guys had an article about it a while back, didn't you? Yeah, it was in uh, Arc News. Arc News, was, yeah. That, I was thinking, I thought I remembered seeing it, and I just I got so excited then too. Like I said, I love Lassen. <laughs> of course, y'all know I'm a big national park junkie. I'm trying to go to all of them. It's a big deal. I work most all of my vacations around it, and so I am I'm definitely a proponent for the national parks. So get me excited bringing up national parks. <laughs> I know I I love it too because you know sometimes Remy and I are road tripping and. We stop at, you know, some of the smaller parks. We stop at some of the smaller, you know, heritage sites. We we go to all of it, you know, when we're when we're out and about. And it's just amazing to get to talk to some of them because I, I feel like sometimes people don't stop and go to the go to the ranger desk. They don't just go and talk to the rangers and have a conversation with them. And they love that. Um, you know, especially at those smaller parks. And they love getting to talk about not just that park or that, you know, uh, the 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 site that you are where, where you are or whatever, but you know they they have interesting stories. Some of them come from interesting backgrounds. Not all of them went straight into the National Park Service, just like not all of us went straight into GIS. Um, some of them have full fledged careers that they've retired from, and now they're in the National Park Service. And I'm like, that's uh, you know that that's what I need to do. Like that needs to be me when I retire. Then I need to go. Somebody can just find me in these amazing national parks doing rangery things. <laughs> I'll find you, but you have to agree to bounce around so you can tell me about all the different parks. Absolutely, for sure, for sure. <laughs> you know, Yellowstone closes. You know, they 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 there's a there's a period in the season when they're kind of closed, and then later after that, you can only get in with snowmobiles. So there's only certain you know people that that that, that are in there. So you got to move around, right? You got and we even ran into some that moved. They they had like a, a camper, like they literally had a camper van. Well, New Mexico, New Mexico. Yeah, we were in New Mexico. And so we ran into a set of rangers. It was a husband and wife couple that moved with their 
RV from different, you know, parks depending on the season and worked in them. And I was like, that's, that's for me. This is my life. <laughs> Here. That's one of the coolest things I've heard. I can see you doing it. I just want to be made aware when you decide to yes. do it. Yes. Okay. And, and updates on where's, where's Melissa? Like where, yeah. where is yes, Melissa? Yes, please. Web map. What? Yes. We need a web map. Absolutely. There you go. <laughs> um, so we can be blogging on the trails, right? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so, okay, a couple more questions, and we're almost there. I, I'm switching gears on you again because you know that's what we've been doing. Um, but tell me about who has been influential to you and your career. You know, I'm thinking from a leadership, mentorship, GIS, otherwise. What What would you say, or who would you say stands out as being influential to you? I think there's a cascading sequence of people in my lives starting from high school I happened to go to a high school that invested in writing specifically we actually had something called writers week where they would use whatever budget they had to fly in real poets and published authors and talk to us the entire week and I would go to as many of those in the auditorium as I possibly could get away with um and so there was a group of teachers there who just, they encouraged developing that skill set, which gave me the confidence to go into it in you know, undergrad and grad. And then when I finally got to be a writer at Esri, it was my industry managers who taught me how to blend the worlds of GIS and marketing and writing. And I still use all of that today. A lot of the people who were my mentors at Esri, thankfully, are still there today. Not everyone, um, but a good number of them. And they they would sit down with me and we would whiteboard out exactly how the industry worked, how it used GIS, and what messages needed to be brought across. Uh, and I use all of that today. So... Uh, there, there have been people like that at every step. And I think at EOS, obviously our, um, you know, our CTO, Jean-Yves, has been sort of a humanity mentor. He really has such a heart for humans that I've learned more from him and how to blend that with business than I've ever seen, you know, anybody have the courage to bring into their business at that level. And it's, it's awesome. It's refreshing. It, again, it gives you the freedom to just be nice to people and put, you know, <laughs> humanity first, business second. I can't wait to get to talk to Johnny. He is so interesting. I cannot wait to collect his story. So if he's yes. willing, he better be ready because he's on my short list too. <laughs> yes. I want, I want everybody to hear the Johnny story. It's just too, yes. it's good not to, not to collect it and share it. And it, can I tell you a story about him that sort of encapsulates what I think of him? I, it's going to embarrass him. Okay. I'm not going to tell him that I told you this. Even better. Let it just run. <laughs> All right. So I must have been a year-ish into my job at EOS. And it was just the conference season, you know, conference here, conference there, conference there. And we had just flown into Jamaica. And, you know, we were filling out the customs form on the plane, like all the countries you've been to before this. And I was so nervous. I mean, I was a lot, a, relatively a lot younger then. And I was not used to flying to places like that. And, I would be a nerve ball. I would be a nervous wreck. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> right. I was right. And, uh, you know, we're supposed to find this van taking us to this complex where the conference is after we get through customs. And we're also supposed to be riding with this guy from Ordnance Survey from the UK, and I'm just, my little world is being blown. Mm -hmm. So I'm walking to customs and I look around and I realize I've lost Johnny. I can't <laughs> find him anywhere. So I'm just in this country. It's dark outside. It was probably around midnight and our whole plane is going to walk to customs. It's just us. And finally, I see him and he's walking down the hall very slowly and he's got a an older woman on his arm and he's escorting her and she looks like maybe she's a little confused a little disheveled and finally you know like okay he's in line of sight so I just waited till he got up to me and then we were in the customs line with this woman and you know I kind of said so 
what's up? <laughs> what's mm -hmm. going on? And um, though it turned out the woman had, you know, some form of dementia or Alzheimer's and she was 80 plus years old and she didn't really remember where she was, but she knew that she had to find her family picking her up outside customs. Mm -hmm. And Johnny escorted her through customs and helped her find her family before, you know, giving a second to think about himself. And I, I tell that story because that was when I really realized who, who's running the company um, mm -hmm. and what, what this company prioritizes. And at the time we were still very small, but as we've grown, that approach hasn't changed. Um, so it showed me a lot coming into this company. Um, and it's, it's how things are run today. So I, that, that one just sticks with me because it's so unique and I've never seen anybody do that. It's the type of person you want to be when nobody's looking. Um, yeah. and, and that's what's running EOS. So it uh, means a lot that we can run like that. Absolutely. He's amazing. He just, you know, d the fact that he would do that is very telling. It speaks volumes for him. Um, and like you said, it's the kind of person you want to be when no one's looking and, and Johnny's is that. And so we, we need to have him on here. We need to talk to him and, and learn a bit, of, a little bit more about him. And, you know, I think it's amazing too, to, you know, that you, that you can work for a company that's being run that way. Um, the way, you know, when you have someone in an executive position like that, and they're running a company, the way they run it speaks volumes and it trickles down, you know, they set the standard for how the environment, for the culture, um, for, you know, everything, for how the business is going to be run, for how you're going to interact with, you know, your customers, they're setting that standard and everyone's looking up to them. And so for Jean-Yves to, I, you know, I think that's just the person he is. I think he's just, you know, just an amazing person. That's, he's going to be who he is all the time, no matter where you catch him. But I'm sure he recognizes that too, that I'm setting the standard for these people who are here. And I'm, you know, this is how we want to behave. This is how I want them to know it's okay to behave. I want them to take care of people like I'm taking care of, you know, them as well as others that, that I encounter that I don't even know. So um, yeah, I can't, I can't wait for Johnny's. <laughs> don't tell him I told you that story though. But, oh, uh, I have loved our conversation today. You and I always just kind of hit it off and resonate really well together. We work really well when we're, you know, having conversations. Um, what are, if any, do you have any final thoughts for us today before we wrap up? I'm just excited. I got another conversation with Melissa and a little bit Remy. And <laughs> as you said, it's always a pleasure. Um, talking about myself is not my favorite thing to do. So uh, I only agreed to this because I think so highly of you both. And I'm excited to see your podcast when you release the full swing publicly. And I wish you guys a lot, a lot of well wishes with that. Thank you so much. And it had nothing to do with me twisting your arm to, to come on here because we did the recording with you years ago, right? And that's, to do with that's true. It wasn't, yeah, yeah. It wasn't <laughs> twisted into this. <laughs> I had a blast though. I had a blast. You're a great interviewer. Good. Thank you so much. I've had so much fun interviewing you today. We've talked about, you know, some really amazing things and some interesting things. I think that, I think listeners will really enjoy it. So I, I really do appreciate you very much for coming on and participating in being a guest. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Sarah is always amazing to talk to. She has such a good insight about people. I love the emphasis that she put on the human element and the human piece. She writes really good articles for EOS. I, I love to read the things that she um, produces and puts out and, and, you know, posts for LinkedIn or posts on LinkedIn. Um, but she really, at you know, she emphasized that the human story is at the heart of what she's doing and what she's working on. And that of course resonated with me because of the efforts that we're doing with this podcast. I'm really trying to capture the people story, not just the technology side. And I'm trying to capture, you know, their journeys, their geospatial journeys. Um, I, I just, I, I feel so strongly that that's such an important piece. I, you know, like we say, it's, it really is where ideas meet inspiration. We have to have that people component. Um, the, the, the people and the needs of the people, that's, that drives the innovation, that drives what we're doing with the technology, it drives kind of the thought process behind where are we going in the future because we need to know what the customers are gonna be doing and what they're trying to do and where are, they, where are we trying to move toward. 
Um, it's just it's just so important, and Sarah gets that. She focuses on that. Um, you know, she really wants to capture those amazing human stories. And I just, I always connect with Sarah. I always enjoy talking with her. But I, I felt like she and I really did connect through the podcast on that on that level for sure. That wraps up today's episode. Please feel free to reach out with your comments, or if you have an interesting topic that you would like to hear, please let us know. Thanks again for your time, and tune in for our next podcast. Music